I am glad Christmas is gone. No, I'm not. I, I wish it was Christmas more than uh, you would imagine. I enjoy Christmas. Uh, this year is a little unusual for Sandy and I. We were, uh, well, we celebrated Christmas with each other, which, uh, I mean, I thought about how many years it's been since we have uh, had nobody around but just her and I for Christmas, but it, it was different. Uh, our children who are away from us, our children, our grown children, they uh, uh, pretty much met up in North Carolina, and they got to see a white Christmas. They had, uh, I think it was about four to six inches of snow up there and above Asheville, North Carolina. That, that's Christmas. Uh, they was out Christmas Eve sledding in it around 8, 30, 9 o'clock, somewhere around in there. But it's a joy. I want to close out the season still looking at Christmas. And I want to talk about Christmas as a Christmas we should never forget. When you think about all that goes on, I am amazed over the years of how few people, few individuals learn from their past. What I mean is we sometimes do something and we say, we'll never do that again. Have you ever done something and you said, I'll never do that again? I mean, typically it was a mess up, something you messed up, something you did wrong. And you say within your mind, I will never do that again. How long does that last? It doesn't last long because I can assure you, if you're like most individuals, we turn around and we do the same thing again. We make the same mistake again. And uh, I have witnessed individuals, I have done it myself uh, in regards to that. So we sometimes, we say we want to do better, but lo and behold, we don't do any better. And I've also done some good things. Can you believe that? A pastor doing some good things? I've done some good things or I've learned a, a new process of getting some of the work done, secular work that I do. And I say, man, I want to remember how I did that because that will help me in the future. But something happens. I put it in what they classified as your short-term memory. You know what a short-term memory is? Just that. It doesn't last, it doesn't register, it doesn't stay in here. And lo and behold, it could be six months, eight months, nine months, I'm doing the same type of, uh, of work, and, and I'm like, I remember doing this before. Now, what did I do? Or the, uh, the passcode that the text support gives me. What was that text support passcode? I wanted to remember that, but I just stick it in my short term, and it just somehow escapes me. And I thought about Christmas. We celebrate Christmas in December, and yet somehow I think that it is possible that we are forgetting what God wants us never to forget. God wants us to know specific things about Christmas, but He doesn't just want us to know it on Christmas. He wants us to continue to carry these things with us wherever we go. He has given us Christmas not as just a day to celebrate, but He has given us Christmas as an adventure to celebrate. A life-changing adventure that we should continue to share and to move forward. We should never forget God's message to us. But many will forget what Christmas is all about. Or many have already forgotten. I mean, Christmas is over, isn't it? No. But many think it is. So I ask, what is it that we as individuals, what do we need to remember? What we must never forget is the question. And, and as we go through this message today, I want you to begin to realize or pinpoint some of the things about Christmas that you as an individual, as well as other people, should never forget. What is it that God was really trying to convey to us and give us the ultimate goal of what Christmas should be doing in the lives of individuals. I'm here to tell you that if more people really experience what Christmas is all about, we would begin to see a change in our society. We wouldn't have the hatred. We wouldn't have the, the bitterness. We wouldn't have the anger. We wouldn't have the hostility. We wouldn't have all these problems that we are facing today. 
So with your Bibles, I want to read a passage out of John. Now, John is the, the fourth gospel that we have in the Bible. In John chapter 1, John does something completely different than Matthew and Luke does. Uh, John begins way back yonder. And that's in the beginning. Now, none of us was back in the beginning. Uh, it, 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 we begin to see the process of what John says to us. He says in the Bible... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that's a statement of fact. We know that. If you go back to Genesis, you're going to find the concept of they said, let us, let us make man in our own image. So here we have, John says, Christ, the Word, was in the beginning. He goes on in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, we've got to begin to understand, this is where John begins the story of Christmas, or the birth of Christ, or Christ, the Son of God. He says, all things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. We all are aware, verse 5, that once you strike a light, a match or something, it dispels the darkness. And the problem that we're seeing in society today is there's not enough of us who are lighting the way for the lost world to find Jesus Christ. Let's go on. I want to go down to verse 10. Uh, verse 10, he goes and he begins to establish, he says, He, that is Christ, this word, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John begins to establish this word became flesh. Jesus Christ became flesh. And he came, became flesh for specific reasons. So I want to begin to look at uh, several reasons what we should never forget about Christmas. And you can begin to relate it to what John is saying here. You can look in the Old Testament, uh, Micah. You can look in the area of, of Isaiah. You can begin to see in the book of Psalms. You can begin to see all these other passages of scriptures come to life in the birth of Jesus Christ. So what we should never forget about Christmas, the first thing that I want us to realize is, number one, is God knows our needs. Now, we see that there in John's gospel. John says that in the beginning, the word was with God, and, and it established here. And he begins to establish, and he begins to say in verse 3, all things were made by him, that is, everything that is needful, God made for us. And this is what we need to understand. God knows our needs. He knows your needs today. He knows exactly what you need in order to sustain your life. He knows what you need in order to become the fullest that he knows you can become. Now listen, this is what it is establishing. God knows our needs. That Christmas, many years ago, establishes God knows our needs. Now I'm saying our needs very specifically because it's not our wants. Many people have wants that are not what God knows that we need. And therefore, why should God give you what you really don't need? So God specifically gives our needs. So what is it that we need? God knows, and, and this need that we have, God knows our need is in the area of salvation. And that's what we'll begin to see and, and to experience through uh, the message today. So God knows our needs. God knows your need. What is it that you really need? You think you need a lot of things. But if you're not, here, here's what we read in the Word of God. If you're not thanking God for what God has already given to you, if God gives you more, you're not going to thank God for that. You have to learn to be content with what God has given you in order to begin to realize everything that you have belongs to God. So God knows our needs. 
Also, we see in the message of Christmas that we should never forget is that listening to God is always best. We listen to a lot of things. Some of you like listening to uh, your friends. And you realize that sometimes your friends can get you into a lot of trouble. And so listening to your friends is not always the right thing. Well, what about some of the, the writings of uh, the books that we read or, or the uh, TV programs that we... Listening to that is not always the right thing. But listening to God is always best. Now think about the Christmas story. You have several individuals who listen specifically to God and what God was saying. We know that Mary listened to God. And Mary says, Lord, be it unto me as your will. Lord, here I am. I surrender. Joseph also, he surrendered, submitted to God. He acknowledged that God was in control. He didn't understand it all, but he listened to God. I mean, you think about it. Here he's debating, should I put Mary away? I mean, she's been unfaithful. She's, she's expecting a child that's not my child. But yet he listened to God and he obeyed God. Which in the concept... Uh, not only Mary and Joseph, but we could go into the area of the shepherds. How the shepherds, they listened to the angels as the angels proclaimed there in, in, in the field while they was keeping watch over the sheep. And they listened and they came with haste. They hurried to find this Jesus Christ. You see, the, the message of Christmas is so important that we need to listen to what God is saying to us. Uh, we could talk about the, the, the wise men, the shepherds, all these individuals, as I've said. But what about you? Listening to God is always the best. Now, let me ask you a very uh, fundamental question. When do you find yourself in more trouble or most trouble? When you listen to God or listen to yourself? Listen to yourself. When we listen to God and we follow God's words, we will never find ourselves in a mess. That brings us to number three. Obedience to God brings joy. Obedience. I mean, that is the out now. Obedience to God. That is a, a trusting God and saying, okay, God, if you tell me to jump, I'm not going to ask how high. I'm just going to start jumping. You know? God, I'm going to obey you. God, if you tell me to go, if you tell me to stay, if you tell me to serve you, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to do whatever you say because, God, you're on the throne and you're all that matters. You see, we look in John's gospel and it establishes here. God, God is the creator. We didn't create this. God created it. And if God created it, we need to be obedient to the creator. And by obedience to the creator, it brings joy. Simply put, obedience always brings joy. Now, let's, let's think about that in a very practical sense. When you obey your parents, does that bring joy? Well, sometimes it's great. Well, what about if you disobey your parents? Does that ever bring joy? No. So obedience brings joy to us. And what we begin to look at is the concept of the Christmas story is revealed to us. The greatness of Christ. Obedience to God brings joy to your life. And number four is the area of room must be found for Christ. I, I'm amazed about how many individuals have no room for Jesus Christ. We live in a society that is falling away from Christ rather than being drawn to Christ. And the reason they're falling away is because some of us who profess Christ don't have the room in our lives to really let the light of Christ shine. How much room do you have for Christ? Well, let me rephrase that. How much room have you given to Christ? Well, I give him just a little bit. You see, what we need to realize is the creator God of all the universe deserves our very best. He deserves it all. And we need to take and give ourselves completely to Him. The room must be found for Christ. We saw that in the Christmas story. We saw that how here is an individual who, uh, he, he says, basically, my rooms are full. The innkeeper. Mary and Joseph coming into town. And other individuals basically turning their back upon Him. But the innkeeper says, 
well, I've got, I've got just a little bit of room. People, let's, let, let me tell you this. If you give God a little bit of room in your life, I mean sincerely give him a little bit, he'll work a miracle in your life. That little room will become an open to him to say, Lord, take all of me. But by the innkeeper saying, here's a little place you can stay in the state. You see, we got to find room for Christ. We find room for everything else. But it seems Christ, the church, is put on the back burner. We need to put it on the front burner. Let's go on. Number five, seeking Christ is a journey. I like journeys. You like journeys? I, I, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, sometimes taken good journeys, and some of them have been very short. Some of them have been, you know, not far, a couple miles, and that, that's it, we're there. I like uh, those kind of. And then I like the long journeys. And what we need to realize is as we are portrayed in the scriptures that Christmas is about journeys. And what we need to do is to realize you may have a short journey as you establish and set up maybe in this upcoming year to read your Bible through. This is an, a, a journey that you will take. And I guarantee the devil will try to thwart you from reading your Bible through. But what we do is we set out on the journey, and it is a long journey. It is not a very, it, it, it's not the 50-yard the dash. It is a marathon in which we are to seek Christ is a long journey. Life's journey. And the more I live, the more I marvel at God's love for me. That's life's journey. Because I realize just how much he's done for me. How much he's forgiven me. How much he's helped me to grow in his grace and his knowledge. Isn't that what the scripture tells us in uh, the gospel of John? There in verse 14. That Christ was full of grace and truth. I mean, he just gives it out. Gives it out. Gives it out. And so when you start a journey with Jesus Christ, it is not just to last for a season. Not like people celebrate Christmas and it's gone until next year. But it is a journey that starts at the manger of Jesus Christ, goes through the cross, and it goes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it changes us to where we live for Christ from this day forever. Living for Christ forever. Seeking Christ is a journey. I mean, you got to get on board. you got to begin to get in, in, in line and let's, let's take this journey and move forward. I don't want to go back. I don't want to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I want to go forward in the power of Jesus Christ. Not only that is the area of seeking Christ as a joy, but Christ needs to be shared. People are starving. If people are starving, why aren't we feeding them? Now that's both figuratively and spiritually. We need to begin to feed individuals. We need to help to those who are hungering, those who have that desire to know or, or to find out why we have peace in the midst of all this havoc of what's going on in the COVID-19 experiences. People I've known have died. People you know, some very prominent people from our surrounding area. But people are hungering to have what we as Christians have. So Christ needs to be shared with other individuals. We need to give Christ away. We need to somehow encourage somebody and say, let me tell you what Christ is doing in my life. There's opportunities after opportunities. But rarely do we share. But yet in the secular world, we share a lot of things. Christ needs to be shared. You can't say too much about Jesus Christ. Let's go on to the next concept. Because we live in a culture and I have looked at what has happened this past year. And it has amazed me about how God is still on the throne. I know that. But how much God has continued 
to show his power in the midst of all that goes on. By that, what I mean is giving to Christ is essential. And I have learned that the more we give to Christ, the more Christ gives back to us. Amen? Now you say, how does that tie into what's happened? It amazed me during the shutdown of the church. By the way, I will reemphasize, our church never shut down. The church was always open on Sunday morning and Wednesday night for people to come and to pray. It will always continue to be open for people to come and to seek Christ. But what I noticed is how when people put God first, when individuals came and prayed, what God began to do is he showed forth the abundance of his grace, his glory, and he says, if you will worship me, I will meet the needs that you have. So what am I saying? All the financial needs of our church have always been met, even when we weren't having offering plates passed. You know, if you don't pass an offering plate, you're not going to get, you don't manipulate people if you don't pass that offering plate. You know how some of those ushers are? They look at you and say, you know, like, you haven't given enough. I've heard of the pastor who uh, took up a collection, and when it came to the front, he looked at it, and he looked at the congregation, he says, y'all can give more than that, and he passed it again. That's manipulation. But what we saw was giving to Christ was essential for Christ to give back to us. Now, let me talk about the things that we need to give to Christ. What we need to do is we need to give Christ our time. First and foremost, we give Christ our time. Don't, get, don't wait to the end of the day and say, Oh, God, I'm about to go to sleep, so I need to read my Bible. And, oh, I go to sleep. You know, we need to give Him our time. We need to give Him the best of our time. If you're an individual who is alert in the morning, just focus upon God. At lunchtime, focus upon God. Whatever time, give God the time that he deserves. That is in all things that you do. Not only that, in the area of your talents. Why, we're, some churches, they're not even allowed to sing anymore. Why, we're going to spread the germ. Maybe we need to spread more of the germ of Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, don't sing. You might pass on the germ. But to talents, you've got talents. God has given you talents. Are you using your talents? Are you giving these to Christ? Giving to Christ is essential. Not only in the area of giving your talents, but giving of ourselves. Give of ourselves. Give of ourselves. We give ourselves back to God. And God will bless. Even the least of us. If we would just say, Lord, here am I. That's what Mary did. Mary didn't know all that was about to happen, but Mary just says, Lord, okay, here I am. And it made such a difference. So we need to give Christ, given to Christ is essential. If we look at John's gospel, we find that he, verse 10 says, he was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. That's sad. We're not given to Christ. Not only that, he says, he came to his own, to the Jewish people, to the ones that should have been expecting him. And they had no time for him. Well, that's where we are today. The church. The church. Christ has come to us. And giving to Christ is essential. We are to give ourselves fully back to him. Now let's talk about uh, uh, something else in regards to this. Christmas is that our Christmas that we should never forget is we should never forget it is because of Christmas that lives are changed. Lives are changed because of Christ. Lives are changed. When Christ changes a person's life, they always change for the better. When Christ changes them. When they run from Christ, their lives may change, but it is not for the better. So you can choose 
which way you're going to respond. Are you going to choose Christ and allow your life to become better? Or are you going to be like Herod and say, well, I'm not going to choose Christ. I want to stop Christ. And your life becomes worse and miserable. It is said that his life was miserable because of the birth of Jesus Christ. Lives are changed because of Christ. Ask somebody who's accepted Christ. They'll tell you, Christ changed me. I once was lost, but now I'm saved. Which brings us to the, the next is our fears and our despairs are replaced. Your fears. What, is the, what do you have fear of? It is, it is alarming that even people within the church have fear of dying. Why would we have fear of dying? We should not fear death because we know that death actually ushers us into the presence of Christ. And to know that, I have no fear of dying. Now, I do have fear of snakes. Matter of fact, I will tell you all this morning as I uh, was taking a look and rearranging and, and finishing the, uh, uh, the arrangement of the flowers, there was not a snake in here, but there was a lizard. Y'all like lizards? I don't like lizards. I don't like snakes. I don't like lizards. I don't like spiders. God has educated me beyond your ability. He knows that this guy. But there is a lizard right down here in the front. Right here on the bottom step. And I said, you know what? If I don't get that lizard out of here, we're going to have the Toombs County lizard running loose and people are going to be shouting. I probably should have left them, Amen. I said, okay, God, it's you and me. Nobody else was in here. I said, it's you and me against this thing. And I'm thinking within myself, last thing I want to do is, is grab that lizard in my hand. So I pull out my trusty, you know, uh, 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 Leatherman type pliers with all that stuff. I said, well, if I could just pinch that tail and grab it and I can't take it out like that. I couldn't get close enough with those. I said, okay. I said, Lord, give me the strength. Get, calm my fears and help me to grab that lizard and get it out of here. Well, any of you seen the lizard running loose yet? <laughs> That's because I did, kid. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the fears, God calms the fears, the despair, the, you know, the depression that people have. We need to know that the message of Christmas took and eliminated all that. There's no fears. What should we fear? Death? <laughs> For a believer, that's glory. To be in the presence. It says in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of, the, uh, uh, nor of flesh, but of God. God redeemed me. God restored me. God eliminates my fears. And God gives me the courage to do things. Otherwise, I would be unable to do. I don't worry about tomorrow. I enjoy today. And if I worry about tomorrow, I'm not going to enjoy today. So God has given us Christmas to eliminate the fears and the despairs that individuals have. So what should we do? Three things. Receive God's gift. That's the first thing we need to do. In our culture, in our generation, in light of all that has happened, what needs to happen is people need to receive God's gift. That was assigned to the shepherds. The babe will be wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Wrapped. Christmas wrapped. Receive God's gift. You can't unwrap it until you receive it. So you receive it, then you can begin to unwrap it. And when you begin to unwrap God's gift, Jesus Christ, something happens inside of us. What happens is, and what we should do as individuals, is receive God's gift, and then what we ought to do is begin to love and to cherish God's gift. Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you cherish Jesus Christ? Do you take Christ wherever you go? In my wallet, 
For many years, I have carried a picture and pictures of my family. Do you do that? Some of you do, some of you don't. But it is to where I can establish and say to individuals, when I open and, and I, I look and I, I pull out a credit card, there's the family, there's people looking back at me, people that I love, I cherish them. But more important than they is God. I cherish God. I love God. And by loving God, it allows me to reach the next thing that we should do as individuals is we need to share God. Let me ask you, have you shared God as much as you should have this year? I venture to say we haven't. If God is the answer, and He is, we need to share it. We need to give people what they need, not what they want. They need Jesus Christ. They need to keep Christmas alive within them. And it is the birth of Jesus Christ that we hear that the reason He left heaven to come to earth, He came that we might have a Savior we might have a deliverer from our sin's bondage. And if we turn to him, our lives will never be the same. What if this is your last opportunity to do what God has patiently been waiting for you to do? What if it is your last opportunity? Do you know the Christ of Christmas? How do you know if you know the Christ of Christmas? By answering this question. Is Christ in you? Is Christ in you? Is he in you? You see, I don't want you to answer about somebody else because we're so prone to do that. We're pr so prone to say, well, if that person's going to heaven, they, they claim to be a Christian. If they're going to heaven, I've got to get there because I'm better than them. No, 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 no. Is Christ in you? Is the manger scene still just the manger scene? Or has Christ become your Savior? My Messiah. Is Christ in you? Pray with me. Father, I pray for each of us today that we would keep the message of Christmas on our minds constantly. You proved your love. By sending Jesus. To be born. In the flesh. Like unto us. Yet he sinned not. He was the perfect lamb. The sacrificial lamb. That was nailed to the cross. For my sins. And the sins. Of the world. I pray. That our life would come from you and shine so bright that either it would attract people to you or people would be so embarrassed that they don't know Christ that they would start having that hunger. Reveal to us our emptiness and fill it with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, I pray.